as you know, I've spent the last decade representing Jefferson County in the legislature and now in Congress, and it's also the community that I grew up in, so it's very meaningful to be hosting the Vice President of the United States here. Now, I've only been in Washington for a couple of months, but I've spent 15 years working along so many, alongside many of you in this room, trying to make Colorado an even better place to live. And you all are here because you know that the most urgent threat that our, face, that our state faces to enjoying the Colorado way of life and continuing to thrive here is the climate crisis. So that's why we're here today. And I wanna thank all of you for taking time out of your day to be with us and for being engaged citizens fighting for a brighter future. And I could not be more excited about our guest today. So joining us first is one of the best female climbers in the world. She has spent 22 years climbing and also lives here in Colorado. Sasha has been the female overall world champion in climbing, has traveled to over 15 countries in this field, and accomplished more than 31st and first female since around the world. And after reading her bio, I can tell you that her job sounds much scarier than running for Congress. <laughs> Sasha has seen firsthand the effects of climate change and she has become a passionate writer, entrepreneur, and fierce activist fighting to protect our planet. Please join me in welcoming Sasha DeJulian. Thank you so much for being with us today, Sasha. And can you believe that we're gonna be sitting with the vice president on stage? It is truly incredible to be with you. I'm so honored. And my mom, who's here in the front row, um, <laughs> I don't think she ever thought when I started doing this random little sport called climbing that I would be here meeting Madame Vice President. So no, I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't either. Uh, and now it is my incredible honor to introduce a woman who has inspired so many of us, and most importantly, girls across the country who finally see someone like them represented in the White House. But she is an inspiration far beyond the barriers she has overcome. She has spent her life trying to make our nation better, and it is especially passionate and effective in her fight in the climate crisis, to address the climate crisis. From her landmark bills in the Senate on climate equity and increasing access to clean water, to shepherding huge packages through Congress, which as you know is incredibly difficult, um, that address everything from clean energy and electric vehicles to the health and safety impacts of climate change that, they, that it has on our daily lives now. I am so thankful for her leadership and beyond proud that she's here visiting the seventh district. So please join me in standing to welcome the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Hi, everyone. <laughs> wow, this is truly surreal being up here with you. I, I know both of you and so many of us in this room today feel the gravity of the situation that we're in. And as a new member of Congress, my top priority is fighting to protect our one and only planet at the national level. 
So being from a state like Colorado, we're far too familiar with the devastating impacts of climate change. As our water dries up and our wildfire season is year round. This can be very scary for many of us and threatens the very existence of communities across Colorado. But right now, I have hope for real change. Yeah. As the White House and Congress are making a historic investment in our climate, we're at a tipping point. How are you thinking about this moment of climate action? I, too, am very optimistic uh, for a number of reasons, including that we have leadership like Governor Polis. Where are you? He was here earlier. Um, Attorney General Weiser, who understand the power of these offices if you have a state that is as bold as Colorado to actually be able to implement policies and show people that beyond a concept or an idea, that it actually works. And it works for the betterment and the improvement of everyone's life for generations also. And so I remain very optimistic because I also couple that with what we've been able to do, our president, Joe Biden, our administration, what we've been able to do that I really do believe is transformational. Um, when you, I've done just the kind of quick math on it. When you, when you combine what we have accomplished with the Inflation Reduction Act together with the CHIPS Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we're looking at about $1 trillion that will hit the streets of America on the issue of climate, <laughs> on the issue of climate. So think about what this means, this infusion of such a substantial amount of resources, which also, by the way, will spur private investment that will then incrementally and, and actually exponentially grow that number and what an impact we can have to really fast forward what is long overdue. Um, on a number of issues that are, is both about what we'll do around greenhouse gas emissions, what we will do around water policy. I think we're going to talk about that. I love water policy. Let's talk about that a lot. Um, it can be you know, what dry, but very important. <laughs> exactly. But let's, you know, let's just, let's have that conversation because I, as a native Californian, all of us as Western states, we understand what it means. We, you know, I grew up with drought. I grew up with all this... Um, all the, the impacts of what this means. But I, let me just get back to the point, which is that this really is a transformational moment. And so when we think about it um, in terms of what it means for our youngest, be it our children, our young leaders, if you are in high school, in college, what this means in terms of what we will spur in terms of innovation around a clean energy economy, the new jobs that will be created, then what that means in terms of diversifying and upskilling the workforce to take on these jobs. It's very exciting. So I, too, am optimistic. And being here to talk about the great work that you've done and what we can expect here in Colorado is so important because it takes time to implement things. So I just want to thank you for actually being here to thank highlight you. these important measures. Thank you. And I, too, am truly honored to be in both of your presence. Um, I really appreciate what both you both are doing for the environment and the climate. Um, I've been climbing for 25 years, visited over 50 different countries. My around. staff got that number wrong. I apologize. <laughs> I said 22. Uh, 25, but I guess that <laughs> dates myself, maybe. Um, visit over 50 year countries, and... Um, you know, I've been able to immerse myself in the most beautiful mountain landscapes and wilderness environments. And through a life lived in the outdoors, I've developed a deep appreciation for the natural beauty of our planet and the diverse global population that cherishes it. But I've also experienced firsthand the devastation of what climate change is doing to these beautiful places. So... I joined the Protect Our Winters Alliance to team up with other athletes and advocates to advocate around climate change policy and to protect the safety, but also bolster the green economy yeah. of the places that we love. Um, so, Madam Vice President, 
how has your life shaped your work on climate and the environment? Well, starting, I guess, from birth, I, I, am, um, I was born in Oakland, California, and um, so, which is in the heart of the Bay Area in California, and the Bay Area takes great pride in being one of the birthplaces of the environmental movement. Um, I grew up learning about, we, we called it ecology at the time, <laughs> and so some of us who were born around that time know what I'm saying. <laughs> And, um, and we talked about it in the context of conservation. In fact, I'm going to share with you a very simple story, which is that I went home one day and I said, well, what's, why are conservatives bad, Mommy? Because I thought we were supposed to conserve things. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't reconcile it. Now I can. <laughs> um, but you know, it was the, the movement. Like it was, it, there was a thing called "Save the Bay." Was a movement. We we talked about water. We talked about air, and, and so I just grew up with it. And I also grew up as a as a child of parents who were active in the civil rights movement. And of course, that being a bunch of folks who were marching and shouting for equality and justice. And I guess the combination of all of that um, at the earliest stages of my life caused me to understand the importance of, of these issues, both in terms of clean air, clean water. Two. Uh, 25, but I guess that dates myself, maybe. Um, as, a, as a child of parents who were active in the civil rights movement. And of course, that being a bunch of folks who were marching and shouting for equality and justice. And I guess the combination of all of that um, at the earliest stages of my life caused me to understand the importance of, of these issues, both in terms of clean air, clean water, t cherishing this beautiful planet that we have, but also in terms of principles of equity, understanding the inequities, which you know we all understand the difference between equality and equity, right? Um, equality suggests, well, let's give everyone an equal share, everyone, right? But equity understands not everyone starts out at the same base. And so we need to take that into account and, and, and have policies that, that are motivated by equitable outcomes. And um, when I was elected district attorney of San Francisco in 2003, um, I created one of the first environmental justice units of any DA's office in the country, um, in large part because at the time, and still, there is a community in San Francisco called Bayview Hunters Point, which at the time had a annual household income of about $15,000, one five. And um, not surprising, there, that community was also the, the, the recipient of a lot of dumping and, and, and just very bad behaviors, a lot from people outside of the community. And there were high rates of asthma and health outcomes. And so I took that on. I took it on um, from the perspective saying that not only do we want to encourage good behaviors, but there needs to be a consequence for bad behaviors. And as Attorney General of California, um, I took that same approach when it came to, for example, a big oil spill in Santa Barbara that many of you probably remember and, and read about, where there needs to be also accountability and consequence, as well as what we can do to encourage in, and create incentives for good behaviors. And then um, fast forward in the United States Senate, some of the work that I did with folks like Michael Bennett at the time. and. And, um, and, and what you all are doing here was around understanding how federal policy around extreme weather and extreme climate had taken into account historically tornadoes and hurricanes, but hey, let's also think about how we're dealing with drought and wildfires and, and bringing to bear a perspective from Western states around how it impacts this region of the country a bit differently from other regions of the country. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, the trajectory. And then, of course, now the work that we are doing around um, pushing for and now implementing these bills and what it can mean, and also what it means globally. Um, you know, talking with, I've now met with the 100 world leaders, over 100, right? Presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, and kings. And almost every time I have interactions and conversations with them, this topic comes up because, of course, this is a global issue. And we hope that we can use the recent accomplishments, those three bills and this 
amount of money and infusion to really create and accelerate models of how we can grow a clean energy economy, not only for the United States, but globally. Thank you. And that's such an important point is that we're finally leading the world in this space. Yeah, we are that's right. long overdue, but we have finally stepped into that role. That's right, that's right. All right, now it's my turn. <laughs> we have our note cards to make sure we don't mess up. Um, Highlight it. <laughs> Uh, there were so many great things included in the historic bill that bills, the package yeah. that Congress passed. And uh, these new laws are delivering bold solutions with billions of dollars of investments. And I know that we've highlighted some of this, but I just want to emphasize, uh, again, it's about protecting our nation against extreme weather, mitigating against the worst effects of climate change, which we know far too well here in Colorado and expand access to clean drinking water and achieve sustainable energy independence. This is not only essential for uh, addressing climate change, but we know that this is a national security issue. Right. The bipartisan infrastructure law also includes $5 billion to address wildfire resilience, yeah. including the smoke impacts that our communities face. Yeah. And this is absolutely critical, and I think of the communities throughout the 7th District and Colorado, uh, especially in rural Colorado. So mm -hmm. these have, all of these bills have a lot of my wish list checked off. <laughs> yeah. These are things that we wanted to get done for a very long time, and you all were able to do it. So what are some of the policies that you're most excited about? Well, let's talk about water policy. Um, so we also have designated, I believe about, it's at least $12 billion for Western water issues, right? So that's going to be the resources that we need to, to diversify water policy. And by that, we all know what that means, right? We need to be equally invested and prioritized in everything from conservation and recycling to, to water storage, in, in particular underground um, storage. Uh, what we need to do in terms of thinking about water policy around flood capture you know, we, we, have, we have grown up with a system that when there are floods, we, the, the state of mind is to address the emergency at the moment, which means for many states that are coastal in particular, flush that water into the ocean instead of capturing it. And so thinking about how we will build not only for this moment, but really critically evaluate what we have been doing to understand that some of it just hasn't been very smart, in particular when we are now facing increased drought and these extreme um, changes. Water policy, you know, we're seeing what some have called the whiplash effect, right? On the one hand, extreme rain. I just left California this morning. Looking out the window of the plane, at the mountain tops that are behind downtown Los Angeles, feet and feet and feet of snow. And so, so far, so good that it hasn't been too hot, so that that snow then melts all at the same time, which could be disastrous after years and certainly months of drought, which means that the soil cannot absorb all that water if it flushes too quickly. But we're looking at everything from drought to extreme rain and, and, and snow. And here in Colorado, I don't need to tell you what that has meant. So thinking about water policy in a way that we take into account these extreme conditions and the fact that we get whiplashed between them. Um, thinking of it in terms of what that means also as an extension of water policy, and, it, it's a, and I think of it as an extension of water policy, and certainly an environmental justice issue and an equity issue, things like lead pipes. Um, I have been traveling the country, the communities that have been just at you, screaming, crying, the grandparents, the grandmothers, the grandfathers do something about these lead pipes because the water that comes through those pipes is toxic and has extreme impact on the health 
in particular of children and vulnerable populations, seniors, but also the, the nature of it is such that it also impacts um, learning ability. And so then think of the intersection here where we're talking about environmental justice, we're talking about public health issue, we're talking about an education issue, and we're talking about, as an optimist, an opportunity to use what we're gonna do with this infrastructure law to put billions of dollars to get rid of all the lead pipes in America over the next nine years. And, and what that will mean in terms of jobs, because we also partnering with folks like IBEW and all of our friends in labor with those great apprenticeship programs that are teaching these highly skilled workers how to do the work that we need to get done in the best interest of all of us. So, you know, water policy can go in all these different, it, it flows in different directions. <laughs> Oh, I have puns on water. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I just want to thank you for your leadership on that as, as a mom, thinking about what communities yeah. are facing around lead pipes and what we're going to face with the consequences of that in the long term. And yeah. it's hard to believe in the most wealthy country in the world that we were unable to do this before. But I just want to thank you for finally getting that done. But and may I also mention, though, on the issue of lead pipes, because it... it it transcends that issue of lead pipes. Remember, lead pipes were installed throughout the country, uh, not just in low-income communities, not just in communities of color. But what, and, and this is about the principle of equity, but what it could end up, and what would end up happening is a homeowner who has the resources or has equity in their home to take something, take some money out, will then just replace their lead pipes and put in clean pipes if you have the money. But when you don't have the money, or if you're a renter, or you're living paycheck to paycheck, then they couldn't. And so the significance of what we are doing with the infrastructure law around lead pipes is we're saying this is a public, this is a public health matter. It affects all of us. Again, look at the intersection around public education, public health, right, all of that. And so we are saying that therefore, it is in the public interest to use public resources to address it, instead of requiring those, home, those renters and those families to do it on their own. So keeping in mind what we are, have been doing in the last two years to also talk about what people have a right to expect their government to address. And especially for all the parents here, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles, who show up at town hall meetings, who show up at community events, who are talking about why leaders must take seriously what is happening, keep doing it. Because these are the things that come out of that. <laughs> Truly. Thank you. This last fall, I spent, over a month sleeping under the stars and experiencing really extreme changing weather patterns while going after a new record-breaking first female ascent with my team. Yeah. And something that you really experience while on an expedition is everything is down to the extreme but also minimal. Yeah. You're navigating extreme rockfall, which can be fatal consequences. Um, navigating through sporadic weather patterns, which can lead to really scary storms. Um, and then when I came home to my house in Boulder, Colorado, we were actually evacuated because of a wildfire. And I don't want to stray far from the script because my next question is about water policy, which <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not going to get in trouble here, but I know you're particularly passionate about water. So love to hear as well your favorite water pun. I think that we got a little uh, hint to that. They just kind of roll out of me. You know, but yeah, I, I'd love to, you know, water is the lifeblood of Colorado. Yeah. And you're right, it's and so interconnected river, yeah. to everything. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd love to just hear more on the specifics yeah. of water policy. Well... I, I'm gonna, I'll answer it and then I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so one of the, the, the aspects of water policy that I also think is 
very important is it really does highlight the interconnection and interdependence between us all, regardless of geographic borders. And you know, take for example the Colorado River, take for example Lake Mead, all of these water sources, what's happening in California, how that affects Colorado, how what's happening in Colorado affects the region. Um, we are so interconnected and interdependent. And to the extent that we fully embrace that point, I think we will be smarter with policy and resources and, and understand the importance of collaboration. Uh, I think about water policy through the context also of another seemingly unrelated issue, but space. So I am the head of the Space Council. I love space. And, so does um, Ed Perlmutter. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. And so think about it, right? So there is now technology, in fact, we just recently launched it, satellite technology that is now mapping, now mapping water around the globe. So we can now see where it is and where it's flowing. This is extraordinary. Because it is now this satellite technology from space will allow us here to have a sense of where it's going, what the trends are, and how we should be thinking again about the interconnection and, and, and the interdependence. Um, what it will mean when we think about agriculture and the ability of people to grow food. You mentioned earlier, the Congress member mentioned the, the point about national security and the interconnection between extreme climate, water policy, and national security. Just think about it. Human beings need to eat food to live. Okay, so if a community or a particular geographic location is experiencing extreme drought over years and years, they cannot grow food. They will then leave that place to go somewhere where they can grow food. And they may go to a pl place that speaks a different language and prays to a different God, which invariably will lead to some degree of conflict. And as you look at the globe, and then put it in the context again of, of what we're going to be able to see with all this technology about where water is going, where we are losing it, and what that will mean in terms of global migration, of which we are seeing the largest amount of global migration that we have seen in generations, and what that might lead to in terms of conflict. Um, it is very real. And so these issues are all connected, and in that way, water policy um, is one of the factors that when we address it um, with an intentionality and intensity, we will invariably have an impact on a lot of residual um, and related issues. Because, you know, when we have the ability to map it and, and have the data, one of the things, I'm going to Africa at, at the end of the month, and this is going to be one of my areas of focus, is climate resilience and adaptation. And with this satellite technology, what we can do if we collect the data in a way that is accessible to everyone, not just people who have a PhD, but people who are equally, if not even smarter, who are farmers, <laughs> people giving people access to that technology, that data, so they can then make decisions about when they are planting their crops and what kind of crops to plant, right? So, again, these things are all connected in a very important way with multiple layers in terms of impact. This is something that I think about most immediately, the effects in Colorado. Yeah. In the 7th District, it goes all the way to Buena Vista and Salida through Chafee, yeah, all the way right. through the mountain communities. The Arkansas River is the lifeline there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they completely rely on the diversion of the Colorado River. Yeah. And we know that yeah. we are in a dire position right now with uh, the lack of water. And so uh, you give me hope with what you are highlighting with the new technologies that will be coming about yeah. that we can actually utilize to address some of these issues. But I think about the farmers who are there right now uh, who are already yeah. going to be facing some of this. Right. Uh, right. Well, so the next question 
as a mom, and I know there's a lot of moms in the room today. Can I actually get a show of hands for all the moms that are here? Look at that. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for taking time out of your day, being here on a work day, and also coming during what is, for many of us, our kids' nap time. <laughs> uh, I see, I want to get, Davis is currently sleeping back here. Uh, if you could raise your hand, my, hus my amazing husband who makes this work possible. Love you so much. And I wanted Davis to raise his hand, but he is dreaming over there. Um, so Davis is only three, and I'm terrified not just about what his future looks like with the climate crisis, but what the immediate health impacts are for him and for families like ours. You know, growing up in Jefferson County, we were always outside, playing in the foothills and the mountains, going to soccer practice and tournaments. And now I see alerts on the news stations about days where it's unsafe. It's recommended that, that kids do not go outside, where they have games canceled because of how unsafe uh, our climate is. And so, you know, it is something the most, also the most vulnerable communities who are already have the odds stacked against them and have the worst health outcomes because of the environment they're exposed to every day. This also impacts not just kids, but also moms and especially uh, during their pregnancies. And so uh, I know that you've done a lot of work on maternal health and can you talk about the intersection of the climate crisis on mater and maternal health? It's very significant. Um, so in the United States of America today, black women are three times more likely to die in connection with childbirth. Uh, Native women, twi uh, Latina, I mean, Native women twice as likely and rural women one and a half times more likely in connection with childbirth in America today. And there are a number of issues as it relates to black women, for example. It is well documented and the data bears it out. It has nothing to do with her socioeconomic or educational level. It literally has to do with she is walking in that emergency room or clinic or doctor's office and she's just not taken as seriously. And this is a racial bias issue. Um, but it is also for all of these groups of women uh, an environmental issue. And the environmental issue is that there are certain unique stressors that certain women demographically face that obviously will have an impact on their health and, um, and their pregnancy. And so, for example, um, take for example anything from lead pipes to um, some of the work that we are doing now that I'm also very excited about around electric vehicles and what that will mean, electric school buses, right? 25 million children a day go to school on a school bus in America and over 90% of them are diesel fueled, which means not only are those children inhaling those fumes, the bus driver is inhaling those fumes. Whoever is in the educational ecosystem is inhaling those fumes, right? So what it means in terms of a workplace safety issue for that bus driver, not to mention the children or whoever is standing there as the kids are boarding the bus or getting off the bus. And, um, and that's a health issue, and that's a health issue for that mom who is pregnant and has other children. Um, it, a, a issue is, I know it's particularly, I think Denver has the third highest issue with urban heat zones, right? And so what that means in terms of just people who live in concrete areas where there are no trees, it's so basic, right? Um, if, in, if you live in a, a climate that gets very hot and there's no shade, or it's all concrete, and all of us know what that means on a hot day to walk. It's hotter. It, it's hotter. Yeah. And those are stressors. Those have an impact on the health and well-being of an individual. So the work that I've been doing on maternal health in particular to reduce maternal mortality is one, to elevate the issue and to make sure we talk more about it. Again, interconnection, intersection, right, between issues. Um, it includes teaching, 
people in the system around that pregnant woman to appropriately diagnose what is going on in her life to figure out how there can be accommodation and support for her. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm doing there is I, we were, I had a bill when I was in the Senate to say that we need to train doctors and nurses and, and medical health professionals to understand and better understand what pregnant women experience and understand it from a culturally competent way. I wrote into the legislation that some of the best trainers of that um, for medical health professionals will be doulas, right? <laughs> Who really understand quite well and, and are some of the most trusted in the healthcare delivery system um, to be able to do that work. But there's a real connection between issues like maternal health and what is happening in terms of our climate, pollution, toxic air, and what we can do better. Um, so there is that. But I want to get back to Sasha for a minute because oh you started, you have a, such an incredible career. Thank you. And, and, and points of distinction in terms of what you have done being the first in so many ways. And you have been an activist um, and very vocal using your platform as an as a outstanding athlete to also talk about climate. Why? What, what, what got you to do this? I think I will replay that moment. This is being filmed right over and over <laughs> again. I think, I think that's my career highlight right there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm here, and I really love that everyone of you out here is here because we live in Colorado. It is home to such an incredible amount of beautiful landscapes, outdoor recreation. You go outside. I go outside every morning. I've made a ritual of hiking to the top of a mountain with my dog, Miss Chaga. And every morning, wow. I pretend like I'm on a phone call and in an office and not losing my breath. But I'm so <laughs> thankful. I, I feel the dirt under my feet. And I, I look out at this beautiful sunrise, sometimes later than sunrise. And I think, what gratitude yeah. I have for this. And going back to being six and going to my brother's birthday party is how I started climbing. I, um, I, I didn't know what climbing was, but it ended up being my conduit to learn about the world in such a diverse set of ways. And when you travel for climbing, you're living with, with you're camping often. You're living like down on the earth with whatever local um, community there is, and you're getting to know people and you're getting to know the planet. And I think that the reason that I'm here and really trying and truly honored to be in both of your presence and all of you is because we should care. Yeah. Like the, nature is our natural playground, so let's protect it. Nice. Um, but, but coming back to the, the off of me, um, <laughs> You know, I, I am an optimistic person, and that's been a big route that's gotten me through my career is trying to stay positive and optimistic through hard times. Um, and it's without a doubt, our climate is going through a hard time. Yeah. And it's now or never is what I feel, and I think all of us could agree, but yeah. you have so much on your plate, and there are so many big issues to implement. And there are so many policies that feel like they need to be implemented in order for our climate to thrive and to survive. So how do you keep a positive perspective and stay hopeful? Look, I mean, and I mean that. Look at, like, just everyone look around for a minute. It's incredible. We're all in this together. We're all in this together, and I remain hopeful because I've seen in my life that things that people, perhaps some people couldn't imagine, but others could because they believed in it, that these things happen. That, you know, there, I, I feel so strongly that one should never be burdened by 
by anyone's limited ability to understand what's possible. Right? Like, don't let that burden you ever. That's other people's issues. <laughs> um, it, it, we have to have the ability to see what can be and then go for it. And I promise you, and in particular to the young leaders and the youngish leaders, all of us, right, at every stage of youth that we are in here, um, it, nev we can't ever stop imagining in what is possible because we have seen that when we believe in something and we know it is right and good, we can create it, we can build it, and we can do it. And so, you know, electric vehicles, electric school buses. I have been visiting places in the United States of America where we are manufacturing electric school buses, and they are really cool. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we are, and in fact, I think that we are on track, on the road, to... Um, <laughs> It's awful. It's just All awful. <laughs> um, to being actually a global leader in the manufacturing, the building and manufacturing of electric buses. And, um, and so what is that? That's about the, it, it, the, the creation of a whole new industry. It's about um, a workforce. Again, I'm going to give a, a plug because that has to be done to, to, to union labor and what that means in terms of... The, the, the training and the building of that work. And so when we're talking about you know, that workforce, then we're talking about good paying jobs with good benefits and a pension and the ability to buy a home and take your family on vacation you know, once a year. And so there is just so much that is happening right now that gives me a sense of optimism. And you know, I grew up, my mother, my mother um, probably is the first real optimist that I ever knew. Um, my mother had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters, my sister Maya and me, and to end breast cancer. My mother was a breast cancer researcher. And she would take us with her, because she worked long days and long hours and weekends, and she'd take us with her to the lab from time to time, after school and on weekends. Um, and she had, she believed in what could be and just kept working at it and made some, made a couple of discoveries. And I just believe in that. And I think that's what makes us a country of innovators and leaders and believers and dreamers and doers, right? I mean, we should talk, talk let, as a new member of Congress, you're seeing this then from that perspective, but you have a career before you got to the United States Congress of being a leader on so many of these issues. What motivates you? Well, I think it changes over time. For me, I started getting involved to level the playing field for regular people like me, and it yeah. was this community that gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to addressing climate change, it's something that I grew up we all grew up learning about, but it felt like no one was doing anything. And it always was talked about a, it's our obligation for the next generation, yeah. instead of, it is going to impact us all in our lifetime. And I think yeah. that we have to stop just talking about our obligation for the next generation. And believe me, that motivates me more than anything now, having a young son. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to talk about what is happening now and what is going to get exponentially worse if we don't act. But I do have hope with leaders like you uh, who have actually are starting to move us in the right direction, that we can rise in this moment and step up yeah. in a way that we need to, yeah. to save our planet. And, and, and be better. Like, we're saving something, but we're also going to be better. We're... we're we're creating, we're creating, we're innovating. Um, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's not only like, hey, let's throw out the life raft and everybody just pull it in, you know. We're actually creating new things, new ways of doing things. And that's very exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, this has just been a surreal day, something that I'll remember uh, forever. And I just want to thank you so much. Madam Vice President, Thank for you. 
joining us in Jefferson County and in Colorado. And Sasha, thank you for your leadership and advocacy and being such an inspiration as well. Clearly, the Biden and Harris administration is delivering for the United States of America. And I am so excited to be a partner with you in Congress to work on these issues. And so before we conclude, thank you all for coming. And I would just want to turn it back to Madam Vice President for any closing remarks. Um, well, OK, so I mentioned space before. I, I, so I have had the privilege of, from time to time, while on Earth, um, <laughs> um, talking with our astronauts while they're in space. And um, I have almost to a one asked them, what about your travel there and being there, if anything, has changed your perspective about Earth. And almost to a one, they say how beautiful it is when they look at Earth from space and how delicate it is, how fragile in its beauty. And so I would close us out by just saying that um, we all know some of the most precious things are fragile, and that's why we pay special attention to take care of them. And so let's continue to do that. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Vice President.